Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Katherine Seltner in our Washington, D.C. studio. It is truly good to have you here with us. Pro-life leaders reiterate there are two important pro-life protections that must be included in American health care. As the health care debate continues to develop, here are the two protections pro-lifers emphasize must be in the legislation. First, taxpayers must be protected from funding abortion. And second, Planned Parenthood, the largest abortion provider, must be defunded. We are joined now by U.S. Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. Senator, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. You have been summoned to the White House this week to work on health care. What does the administration want in U.S. health care reform? The, the administration is still committed to replacing Obamacare with something which works better for families. Uh, and in the context of this conversation, I will say that also includes making sure that life provisions are protected. So uh, how do we go forward? That's the basis of the conversation. Excellent. And Senator, you have proposed an amendment to the health care plan along with Senators Graham and Heller. You say would allow Americans to afford the coverage they need. Can you, in a nutshell, tell us what the Graham-Cassidy-Heller amendment entails? So all the money the federal government is now giving to states will be put into a flexible block grant, allowing the state to come up with solutions that work best for that state. Clearly, Alaska, with one person per square mile, is a different sort of state to address than Washington, D.C., which has over 100,000 people per square mile. The solution is going to be different. Washington, D.C. cannot dictate a one-size-fits-all. My own state of Louisiana would do something different in the individual market, for example. So let's give that flexible block grant to the states, allowing them to come up with solutions for their state. Protects the federal taxpayer. It's not an open-ended run on the Treasury, but it still allows those states to take care of the folks that live there. Senator, to clarify, does your amendment, A, protect taxpayers from funding abortion, and B, defund Planned Parenthood? Um, so the protecting tax, uh, taxpayer dollars from being spent on abortion that is absolutely one of the goals, and we are writing it to that end. I will note that the uh, Graham-Cassidy-Heller amendment was endorsed by Susan B. Anthony, for example. So we think that we've achieved that. Uh, as regards the defunding Planned Parenthood, uh, we will defund Planned Parenthood. Now, that said, there are procedural issues where maybe because of Senate rules we can't do it through this piece of legislation, but if we can't do it, it won't be because we have not tried. It'll be because the rules do not allow in this particular type of legislation. How important are the pro-life protections in our health care to you, Senator? Would you vote for a plan that did not contain those protections? I would not vote for a plan that did not continue those protections. My wife and I are both physicians, and so we both learned in medical school when life begins and how uh, abortion ends a life. And we both are passionate uh, in our pro-life concerns, beliefs, and what can we do to advance that cause. And we do think that the Graham-Cassidy-Heller Amendment would advance that cause not only, if you will, extending coverage or health insurance to those who have need of such, but also protecting life of those who have need but can't express it. What do you see as the pathway to the necessary 51 Senate votes on your amendment? Well, we will continue to work with governors, listening to them, asking them what would work best for them. If there's going to be momentum, it's going to have to come from someplace else besides Washington, D.C. So if governors can bring their sense of urgency to the table and their endorsement with their input of a better plan forward, we'd like to think that we can go beyond just Republican governors but also get Democratic governors. That changes the dynamic. It allows, uh, again, a freshness of momentum to come in and hopefully moves us beyond a partisan issue into an issue which both Democrats and Republicans can vote for. Senator, as you mentioned, you are also a medical doctor. How is your medical background shaping your view on the health care debate? I spent my whole career working in a hospital for the uninsured. So I, if you will, my whole weeks were with folks that, that really needed health care but did not have coverage. Or if they had coverage, it was Medicaid, which typically did not pay 
a private physician her cost or his cost, and so they'd come to our hospital for the uninsured. It gives me insight into that, the needs of those families, how those families are just like you and me, uh, except they just don't have coverage, and perhaps they have more severe medical conditions than others do. And so I see what I'm doing now in politics, an extension of that which I did as a doctor, uh, which is trying to bring health insurance and health coverage to those who need it but don't have it. Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, thank you for your time. Thank you. In studio now, we are joined by the president of the Susan B. Anthony List, Marjorie Danenfelser. Marjorie, as always, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me again. What do you make of what Senator Cassidy just shared with us? Well, it's a breath of fresh air after a week of frustration, I will say that. I mean, I think you know we were communicating all night long mm -hmm. during the uh, health care bill debate. Around 2.30, we found out it's a no-go. Uh, because of Senator McCain's last-ditch vote along with Senator Mikowski Collins. This today, to me, um, and I've been talking today with Senator Cassidy and Senator Graham, mm -hmm. is a renewed hope that this can possibly be done. In fact, it's um, arguably more pro-life in, in that it covers more, the Hyde Amendment covers more of the health care bill, and um, Planned Parenthood is defunded in it as well. So we haven't gone through the CBO scores, we haven't had the parliamentarian check it out yet, but so far there is no question that we would support such a bill. And I think, look, there is never giving up. And what I love about the spirit of these men is that they are, they are not giving up either, and none of us should as well. So you are optimistic about this amendment. You mentioned Senators Murkowski and Collins. They did vote against the health care yes. plan, mm -hmm. being praised by Cecile Richards now. It's not often you have Planned Parenthood praising Republican senators, are you surprised by this? Well, they are they are worthy of Cecile Richards' praise, mm -hmm. uh, given the perspective that she has, and that really, you know, they've been there. But this um, this really highlights where they've been for a long time, completely aligned with the far left of the Democratic Party. Even the DCCC, which we ought to talk about, mm -hmm. has said that there ought to be a little flexibility on this issue. That maybe in certain cases. Uh, uh, we ought to be flexible and that even the Democrats are going to, uh, they, they are saying, you know, maybe you get to vote for life too. Well, Kurt Murkowski and Collins are aligned with the far left wing of the Democratic Party on the abortion issue. Even a third of Democrats are pro-life. So it was not surprising, um, of course disappointing. They are a remnant of the politics and the ethics of the, of the past, and that is really true. And I do want to get your reaction to that DCCC sure. story that you mentioned. The campaign chief for the Democrats says the party won't have a litmus test on abortion in an interview with The Hill. Representative Ben Ray Lujan of New Mexico says Democrats will not withhold financial support for candidates who oppose abortion. Lujan is the chairman of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Marjorie, what do you make of this bit of news? Is the Democratic Party changing their position on abortion? Well, look, this has been a battle, a personal battle, a movement battle for decades to allow Democrats to have conscience votes. Just allow them to vote what their conscience tells them. I will believe that this is true the moment that the Democratic Party starts to advocate for really common sense, common ground measures like the pain capable bill. Now, they're certainly not going to be a pro-life party. If they limber up a little bit and they allow some of their folks to vote the right way, well, good. Then we can possibly see Heidi Heitkamp voting for the pain capable bill in the Senate. We can see Donnelly doing the same. We can do Tester um, on and on and on. And then maybe we can say, yes, they did limber up a little bit, but I won't believe the talking points until reality sets in and we actually have a pro-life law backed by pro-life Democrats. So we need to continue monitoring that. Marjorie Danny Felser, president of the Susan B. Anthony List, thank you. Thank you. It's time for this week's Call to Action. Conscience protection in our health care is a huge priority for ensuring pro-lifers can live out our beliefs. A new updated draft of the so-called contraception mandate was leaked online earlier this year. Based on what we know from the draft, the updated rule would roll back the attack put into place by former President Barack Obama and give relief to the Little Sisters of the Poor and other pro-life groups. The new rules would protect these groups as well as those who simply have a moral, not religious objection. So they are not forced to violate their conscience and provide contraception and abortion causing drugs in their health insurance plans. But the Trump administration has not yet moved forward on this update. It is time for them to act. With that, here is the call to action. If you believe groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor and even non-religious groups who have moral objections should be free to live out their faith and morality without a breach in consciences, go to your computer right now. 
open up your web browser and type in ProLifeWeekly.com. This is how you can take pro-life action. Type in your basic information and simply click to submit it online. By doing this, you are telling the Trump administration to move forward with updating the so-called contraceptive mandate rule to give relief to the Little Sisters, EWTN, and all organizations that have a religious or moral objection to providing contraception and abortion-inducing drugs and devices. President Trump needs to fulfill the promise he made earlier this year that this ordeal will soon be over. Once again, go to ProLifeWeekly.com to speak up for conscience rights in defense of life. So before the procedure, you do your evaluation, you write, I intend to utilize the temperament techniques for this procedure. A new undercover video released last week by the Center for Medical Progress allegedly reveals Planned Parenthood's medical standards and guidelines include a loophole for abortionists to perform abortions without complying with the federal partial birth abortion ban. The ban prohibits them from performing an abortion on a baby that is partially born. Planned Parenthood requires abortionists to sign a statement of intent saying they do not intend to violate the ban regardless of how the abortion is done. This loophole allows Planned Parenthood to make changes to the abortion technique in order to bring out the baby fully intact so baby parts can allegedly be harvested and sold. We spoke with pro-lifer Lila Rose, who paved the way for undercover investigative work in Planned Parenthood. She explains why these videos only strengthen the argument to defund the abortion giant. Well, the work to expose what Planned Parenthood actually does and who they are which has been ongoing for the last 10 years with Live Action's work, now CMP's work, before that other brave pro-life organizations and leaders have been doing that. It's instrumental in building the public case, the awareness about who Planned Parenthood actually is. I mean, a lot of people still don't know, and before even less people knew, that they're the biggest abortion chain, that they're killing 900 children every day. People don't know that, and when people learn that, it changes their opinion on taxpayer funding and other things. For someone like me, who's a mom of two children with cystic fibrosis, to even think that the hospital could tell me that I couldn't take my child to another hospital to receive better care, um, that I couldn't take my child home to die in his bed, it's just, it's beyond the pale. On what would have been Charlie Gard's first birthday, pro-lifers are instead mourning his death. Guard is the 11-month-old boy in London who had a rare genetic disease. After a long battle in the courts, Charlie's breathing tube was removed in a hospice center last week. His parents fought to have Charlie receive an experimental treatment, but the hospital refused to comply with the parents' wishes. We spoke with two U.S. pro-life leaders who recently met with Charlie's family in London to get their reaction. It's also tragic and, and, and a heart hearts break for them and our prayers go to, to the parents. We'll never know and the parents will never know if they could have given him the treatment when they first asked to, to provide it for him if he would have improved from his condition. So, you know, the parents have to live with that with the rest of their life. And you know, the, as I said, the whole thing was unnecessary, but uh, sadly, and, and I've been saying this quite a bit throughout this, this fight, that that's the reality of our health care today. It's tragic. It's uh, the loss of a young life that did not need to be lost. His parents loved him, adored him, would have done anything for them, and we saw that they did do everything that they could for him, but there are times when it's just not enough. Some media outlets recently claimed a 19-year-old woman in El Salvador was convicted to 30 years in prison for having what she said was a miscarriage. Reports claim Evelyn Beatrice Hernandez Cruz was convicted of aggravated homicide after being raped last year and delivering a stillborn child. But Aussie Prensa, the world's largest Catholic news agency in Spanish, has researched into the case and found Hernandez's conviction is far from an abortion crime. Government officials found sufficient evidence stating Hernandez acted against her newborn child's life. Alejandro Bermudez is the director of Aussie Prensa and joins us now from Denver, Colorado. Alejandro, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. This is a devastating story that we are talking about. Tell us, what are the facts about this case in El Salvador? Is it true a woman was sent to prison for a miscarriage? It's absolutely not true. Uh, there is no uh, penalty in the... Um, El Salvador or any Latin American legislation whatsoever for miscarriage, which we know is, is, is an accident and it's a very painful one for women. 
In this case, what happened is that the woman gave birth to a very healthy baby boy and then kill it. So that's very far away from a miscarriage. Uh, there is no penalty for miscarriage. There is a eight year penalty for abortion, which it, it wasn't in this case. And there is a 20 year penalty for murdering your own child, which is the case of this sad story. It really is devastating. The Aussie Prensa investigative piece on this case mentions this is just another example of manipulation from abortion lobbyists with the different headlines that we are seeing. Can you expand on that? When the boy was, the body of the little boy was recovered, the uh, forensic investigation determined that the boy had, has, had died by breeding and eating fecal matter. I'm sorry to be so graphic, but that's how this healthy, otherwise healthy baby boy died. He was murdered. And uh, it's uh, impossible to, uh, to uh, uh, believe based on the facts that this was in any way a miscarriage. There was a thorough investigation and there were very raw conclusions about what really happened. And yet, would you say pro-abortion groups are perpetuating this idea that it was a miscarriage and what would their incentive be? Well, there has to be a, 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 a little context to this. As you know, most of the countries in Latin America, the, the, uh, uh, abortion is illegal. And especially in Central America, it's illegal in every circumstance. And for 40 years now, the pro-abortion lobby has been pushing to legalize abortion based in what they call, quote unquote, data. And uh, as you can imagine, the number of uh, 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 illegal abortions it's impossible to be known because they are illegal. But these groups come with their own numbers as they did to legalize abortion in the United States in the 70s with uh, totally exaggerated figures. And though that, that strategy has failed in the last years because everybody knows that those numbers are usually denied by health authorities in every single country. So now what they try to do is to have these flagship events or flagship cases that they turn into a reason why to legalize abortion. That's what a Amnesty International, which otherwise should be defending the rights of people in jail and so forth, and has become a major force to legalize abortion in Latin America, came with the case of Evelyn Hernandez. They, they tried to turn it very quickly before they found all the facts uh, into a case to legalize abortion because they say this poor woman, because of a miscarriage, is being sent to jail for 20 years. So the laws need to be changed. Abortion has to be legalized. But after the investigation of the police, the whole story backfired, and they are in hot water right now. We do have a map of those other countries in the Americas that completely prohibit abortion and are pro-life for our viewers to see at home. Alejandro Bermudez, director of Asi Prensa, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for having me. When we come back. I found myself in the darkest place of my entire life and realized I needed, needed help that I couldn't provide myself. We take an in-depth look into how a Catholic ministry helps to heal post-abortive mothers and fathers. Stay tuned as EWTN Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Seltner. She is an impressive artist, a Grammy Award winner with 25 years in the music industry. But this week, we need to speak out against Mary J. Blige and her endorsement of Planned Parenthood. Hey, if you're like me and you stand with Planned Parenthood, we need your voice now. Call your members of Congress and let them know why you stand with Planned Parenthood. That's a video the R&B singer posted on Twitter a few days ago, encouraging her fans to call Congress and persuade them to vote against health care reform that would defund Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood gets nearly half a billion taxpayer dollars and is the largest abortion provider. This is not the first time Blige has stumped for Planned Parenthood, but 
It's unfortunate. She is a prominent cultural figure and holds a lot of influence over young women. But this endorsement is also disturbingly ironic. The founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, was a racist and supporter of Hitler's Nazi party. She believed in eugenics, the dangerous belief we can create a better human race by preventing births deemed unfit. The fact that Mary J. Blige, a successful African-American woman, publicly supports the very group Margaret Sanger founded shows the perpetual deception from Planned Parenthood, as EWTN's own Gloria Purvis reminds us here. When you look at Margaret Sanger's Negro Project, which she started in Harlem with the express intent of putting birth control in the hands of African-American women so that they would stop having babies. And what she did in the Negro Project was she sought out the black minister to go out and put this message out in the community because she knew if she went to speak, she would be met with lots of suspicion. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, people in the community were suspicious of this plan to space births. They saw it as a way mm -hmm. to eradicate the community. And of course, the Catholic Church, with her constant teaching, was there to say this is wrong. Remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell the Trump administration to update the so-called contraceptive mandate so pro-life groups get relief and are not forced to violate their conscience. The latest statistics show over 900,000 abortions were performed in the United States in one year alone. With every abortion, there is a huge loss a loss that many of those post-abortive mothers and fathers eventually begin to feel. For those experiencing that grief after an abortion, you should know there is hope. It's a hope we highlight in this week's Pro-Life Focus. There's an unfortunate notion out there that the Catholic Church condemns not only the act of abortion, but the individual, and that is just not true. Many individuals who choose to abort a baby experience unresolved grief and guilt, which can carry major consequences. Women who have aborted have an 81% higher risk of subsequent mental health problems compared to other women, are 138% more likely to have mental health problems than women who have given birth. And post-abortive mothers have higher rates of anxiety, depression, alcohol use and misuse, marijuana use, and suicidal behavior. The Lord Jesus came to heal us, to forgive our sins, you know, the divine physician. Mary McCluskey wants post-abortive mothers and anyone else impacted by abortion to know they are not alone and there is help. She works on Project Rachel Ministry for the U.S. Bishops Conference. A post-abortion healing ministry, Project Rachel is open to anyone of any faith experiencing emotional or spiritual pain after an abortion. Specially trained priests, a ministry team, and therapists offer such healing opportunities as, you know, of course, the priest, confession, but also spiritual guidance. Uh, there are referrals to therapists. Many dioceses offer retreats, either weekend or day models, um, or uh, support groups that meet monthly or weekly for a, a, an ex a, a specific amount of time. McCluskey emphasizes the ministry integrates both spiritual and psychological dimensions. Priests will talk about you know, women coming to uh, confession multiple times to confess the same sin again and again and again. That's where uh, the trainings that we do and uh, really educate priests and others, the ministry teams in the diocese, about sometimes the need for, uh, typically the need for, to integrate in the psychological approach as well. I knew beforehand that God forgave me, but forgiving myself was one of the hardest things because I regret that decision every single day. Teresa Hessler was a top advertising executive in Maryland when she found herself at a low point in May of 2015. She was running her own business, newly divorced, and discovered she was pregnant. I was feeling hopeless and scared, scared of judgment, scared of failure again, scared of being ostracized, loss of job, loss of relationship, uh, tons of different emotions. Uh, and I panicked and went and processed it almost like a business decision. And it's very much not. And so I decided to have my abortion in hopes that I could just make it go away. Immediately feeling grief, Hessler turned to the internet and discovered Project Rachel. 
Because of the sensitive nature of abortion, Project Rachel is confidential and holds high privacy standards. No one in your parish or local church community will know if you're involved. But Hessler, on her own, wanted to come forward to share her experience with the ministry. The groups were intimate, and I, I was amongst peers that were dealing with the same pain and grief that I was. And we were in that journey together, so knowing that I wasn't alone and to learn how to forgive ourselves and knowing that God forgives us was, was amazing. For Hessler, much of the healing came swiftly. Just two years after first coming to Project Rachel, Hessler is now a pro-life lobbyist and serves as the Director of Administration and Legislation for Maryland Right to Life. It's a really beautiful thing to see how God has changed my life for the better and to honor him and my daughter and to really do his work on a daily basis and to show that pro-life isn't this in the box definition and it's not people that are filled with hatred and judgment and it's really all about compassion and open arms and love and showing others that they're not alone whether it's when they find themselves scared and pregnant or when they find themselves grieving the choice of an abortion. Hessler's witness is a reminder there is always hope. There are people that care and they might be a complete stranger at the time, but they're, they're out there. And hope does not disappoint. We want to reiterate confidentiality is a huge priority for Project Rachel. If you reach out to them, your parish or local church community members will not know. There are very high privacy standards, be assured of that. And if you do want to reach out to Project Rachel, simply go to hopeafterabortion.org. That's it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. You can reach us anytime at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. I look forward to seeing you here again next week. Life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.